In this demonstration, I would like to show you three things. The first thing I want to show you is just a little bit more about tree traversal. Now, when we look at a phylogenetic tree as a picture, then we can probably draw all sorts of conclusions uh, from it uh, about like the tree shape, where are different clades relative to one another, is the tree uh, ultrametric, is it a phylogram, what does the time axis mean? There's all sorts of things that we can conclude with our own eyes. But sometimes that is just not very fe feasible because maybe we're looking at a very, very big tree. And then in under such circumstances, we as researchers might want to write a little bit of our own code to deal with that tree. Now, uh, you are not going to learn how to code within this course, but I do want to teach you a couple of programming concepts which are pretty universal across languages just to show you what's out there. So the first thing is tree traversal. How do you walk across a tree shape, for example, if it's very, very large, uh, to maybe uh, come up with something quantitative such as uh, the path length between two tips. So tree traversal. The second thing that I want you to take from this demonstration is the usefulness of relational databases. So uh, relational databases are a very, very old uh, technology, but still very useful. And it uh, comes up in a couple of different contexts. So for example, when we were uh, doing the R refresher with the data carpentry, there was one section about using R with SQLite. Well, uh, I told you to skip it because it's not something that we are going to apply in the course, but it just goes to show that obviously uh, such databases are so useful that the uh, creators of that ecology course thought, well, you should probably know about SQLite, which is one of the relational databases. Uh, another context in which uh, relational databases come up is when we are using ArcGIS. There are a couple of operations, for example, where you do spatial joins on a GIS data set, where what you are doing is actually operating on a relational database that's active under the hood of the ArcGIS interface. In my own research, I use uh, these relational databases very frequently. You have to think of these as basically sets of spreadsheets, but then on steroids. So, for example, I use these to import sets of uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms all across multiple genomes. So then you're talking about millions of different records, which, of course, Excel would never be able to deal with. But a relational database can work with that just fine. So this is useful technology, which I want to show you. So second learning goal besides tree traversal is becoming aware of relational databases. The third goal is to do a little bit of an exercise with both of these concepts in uh, looking up the evolutionary distance between very far tips on a tree so we have our model organisms, right? Now, these are actually a, from a bunch of different groups, uh, animals and plants and even fungi. But here we'll just look at plants. And what is the purpose here? Well, let's say you wanted to figure out how far apart some species are on the tree. And you might want to do that, for example, to figure out how evolutionarily distinct they are. This is something that came up in the context of uh, the Colin Gross paper and uh, conservation priorities, so evolutionary distinctiveness. But uh, this also comes up within the context of functional diversity. And here the general idea is that the more evolutionarily distinct species are, on balance, it could be said that those are also functionally distinct. Now, that doesn't necessarily always hold true, but uh, branch lengths on a tree are in a number of contexts taken as a proxy for functional diversity. And so, for example, when we apply that to our uh, model organisms and then specifically to the plants, the crops, 
we would expect to see that the most evolutionarily distant and distinct species within the set are probably very, very different. It's probably not going to be two cereal grains, is it? So, tree traversal, relational databases, and an exercise in evolutionary distinctiveness. That's what we're looking at now. And we're going to look at it within the context of uh, some of my own work, uh, which is a, a paper that I published uh, about a year ago here uh, that uh, kind of talks about uh, tree traversal and databases and how you can use these uh, in kind of an optimal way. And we are going to apply some of those concepts. We're going to start out with a simple toy example. And for that, we need to uh, download some data. So we can go to this address for DB3. And here there's a little directory structure with different files that we can click on. And there's two files that we're going to want to have. One of them is called trivial.db which is a database file which we will deal with shortly. And here when I click on download, well, there we go. So that's downloaded. The other is a Newick tree, which is here in the same directory. And in this case, I named it trivial.newick. Uh, I guess we've already seen that uh, File extensions stand for nothing in phylogenetic data if they're all plain text files, and that's the case here as well. So there's the file trivial.newic, and what we are looking at here is the uh, text contents of that file. So you see it's a little Newic tree. Now what I can do is I can just copy the file contents, and then I can have a look at what is actually to be seen uh, in that tree. Now, there's a bunch of things that you can do. For example, you can uh, paste it into fig tree, or here there's another neat uh, tool on the web uh, called uh, ET. Here you see uh, ET from the, from the movie. Uh, and uh, that is, among many other things, also a data viewer. So I paste the tree in here, and I can have a look. And well, there's our tree. So it's a tree where we have a uh, well, basically two clades, the, an in group of A, B, C, and D, and out group of E and F. Here's another uh, tool that we're going to need. And so let's go and download that. And uh, that is uh, called either SQLite Browser or uh, alternatively uh, DB Browser for SQLite. I think the authors had to change the name. I think it was used to be called SQLite Browser, but then that was too closely associated with SQLite. And they're not actually the same initiative, so they had to change it. So now it's DB Browser for SQLite. Okay, <laughs> um, so what is this? Well, this is a little program that allows you to view the contents of a relational database um, and also to run queries on it. And in uh, one of the previous lectures, I alluded to the fact that any language that uh, runs queries on data sets to uh, retrieve bits of information out of it probably ends with a QL. And then I mentioned that for RDF, there's Sparkle, uh, S-P-A-R-Q-L. For relational databases, it's SQL or SQL. Uh, and so we are going to execute a little bit of SQL language, which we can just copy and paste, so not to worry. Uh, and we're going to download this tool. Uh, and it uh, is going to be a pain-free installer, believe me. This is a very common tool, so the installer works just fine. Uh, if you're on Windows, <coughs> you will probably want the uh, standard installer for 64-bit. Um, on a Mac, there's a uh, disk image with the tool. Uh, and if you're on Linux, there's uh, a bunch of different flavors for the different package managers. And if you're on Linux, you probably know what to do. So maybe 
on Ubuntu you would do something like this, right? Um, so let's uh, get the tool and install it. And uh, then we just have that set up for a little bit further down the line. Now here uh, comes a bit of a programming concept that I want to introduce to you. It uh, goes like this. So, um, well, it's called recursion. And uh, here's the general idea. When we did the R refresher, we learned that there's such a thing as functions in, in R and actually in any programming language pretty much that I can think of. Uh, what's a function? A function is a block of code that uh, takes an input or multiple inputs and produces some output and that block of code has a name. And uh, In the R refresher we uh, I think only just looked at this from the perspective of the consumer of the code. So we just did a function call. So we uh, called the name and we provided the input or inputs that needed to go into it. Then the code block does whatever it's going to do and it produces output, which we then retrieve. Now, here's an example of such a function. In this case, this is in the uh, Python uh, programming language. Um, but uh, not to worry, this is basically just pseudocode. So this is uh, just as simple as it can possibly get, pretty much. Here there's a function, and the function has a body, which is these indented uh, commands. And the function has a name, depth first, and uh, the uh, function takes one argument, a node. And then this whole thing with both the contents and the name, <coughs> excuse me, is the function definition. And then in Python, that is uh, uses the keyword def. So here we have a function definition. The input of the function is a node. And the uh, node is so a single node on the tree. And the uh, node has two attributes. One is the name. So you can look up what the name is by uh, executing node.name. And the uh, node has a uh, set of its children. So that could be zero or more children. For example, a tip is going to have zero children. It's still a node, it just has no children. Uh, the other nodes in the tree would probably have two or more children. So if it's a strictly bifurcating, fully resolved tree, every other node is going to have two children. Um, unless there's interior nodes that don't split at all, which you might sometimes see, though rarely. Uh, if the uh, tree is uh, unresolved, then any polytomy is going to have more than two children. right? Now, here comes uh, the neat uh, thing about this. The function has a name, depth first, and the uh, clever thing about it is that you can call the function by its name within the body of the uh, code block. So here this is a, a function that uh, calls itself, uh, you know, like the uh, Uruburus, which is the snake that uh, bites its own tail. Uh, and that is recursion. So uh, recursion is a function that calls itself. Now, what happens then? Let's go over this real quick. Um, the first time when we call the function, we might pass in as an argument the root node. So here, as the function is executed, uh, it, the first step here is that the uh, root has now arrived inside the function body. And here we print out what the name is of the root. And we prefix that with the word pre. Then here there's a little loop uh, that says, well, give me all of the children of the root in this case, and for all of those children, do the recursion. So then pass these children as the argument into this function. 
then we arrive again here at the top so then we would print out the name of the first child that's been passed into the uh, recursion and then we're going to recurse further so then we look at okay well what's actually the list of children of this child and then do the recursion on each one of those so we would go from the root to the first child of the root the first child of that child and so on and so on all the way to the tips and only then we come to a point in the uh, code block where there are no children and so then we can continue on to this part of the traversal where we now do the uh, post order traversal which means that we now come at a part in the walk across the tree shape where we can go from the children so in this case the tips to their parents so we walk back up in the tree and this nature of the uh, recursion where we go from the uh, root to the first child and then each child and then each child and so on and so on that is called a depth first traversal because we first go deep right from the root we go dive in deeply and uh, walk to the tips Consider this tree shape, which we've seen a couple of times. So we have uh, two clades, A, B, C, D, and an outgroup, E. And now we do the depth first rec recursion on that tree shape. So here's then how that goes. Well, we start at the root, which then prints out pre N4. So that's here. Then we go to the first child of that root, so that's N3 on the next line there. And then from there we go to N1, and then we go to A, and then we cannot go deeper because A does not have children. So then we go to B, and from there both of the children have been processed, so then we can continue on in the post-order traversal where we then treat node B with the prefix post and then A and then we operate on the second child of N3 which is N2 and then from N2 we go to C and D and then we go back up D, C back to N2 And then when that clade has been treated, we can come back here in the post order traversal, so the path back from the tips to the root to N1. And then finally we go to E, and then back to N3, right? We always visit tips before their parents where we go in the post order traversal, and then from N3 back to N4. So now we've walked across the tree in two directions from the root to the tips and from the tips to the root in a way that I'm sure is completely mind mind melting um, but this is one way in which you can visit all the nodes in the tree and you can decide how you want to visit them going first to the children going first to the parents uh, there's different contexts within which this is useful so for example when we looked at the likelihood function uh, there was a brief reference made to uh, the fact that the likelihood function is very, very costly. So it might be useful to try to cut some corners. And then uh, the uh, clever uh, pruning algorithm of Joe Felsenstein does that by basically starting at the tips and kind of carrying forward part of the uh, intermediate results. Uh, and so that would mean doing this uh, post-order traversal from the tips to the root. Just as an example of uh, one of the applications of these types of traversals. So here's another one uh, on the same tree. Now imagine that the uh, nodes have slightly different behavior. Uh, so each node now doesn't have a list of its children, but it has a uh, reference to its first child if it has any so a doesn't have a first child but n1 might have as its first child a or n3 might have as its first child n1 uh, and 
every note has a reference to its next sibling. So A is aware of B as a reference. This might seem really obscure and arcane. Uh, now, there is actually good reason for some of this. So, for example, uh, in the previous implementation where there was a list of children, uh, well, depending on whether the tree is fully resolved or not, if it is not fully resolved, then that list of children can be of variable size. And there are some programming languages where that's kind of an inconvenience if you don't know ahead of time how big that list is going to be. That's uh, when you have to pre-allocate memory, which is all kind of scary, uh, not something we're going to go into. But uh, long story short, this kind of uh, way of traversing a tree is not just uh, a complete insanity, it's actually useful sometimes. Now here's one way in which you can then uh, navigate across that tree. So here we again have a recursion, but now we say, well, first we print out the node name in the pre-order traversal and here in the post. So you can see that again, this is at the top and the bottom of the code block. And then we say, well, if there is a sibling, uh, let's go and do the breadth first where we recurse with the sibling as the next argument. And if we have run out of siblings, well, then we move deeper to the uh, next level closer to the tips. So you can maybe understand intuitively why this is called breadth. So this is more broad, where we first go over everything that's at the same uh, level in distance from the, uh, from the root. And only then do we move closer to the tips. And when we walk across this tree, you now see that we uh, visit the nodes in a different order. And just keep in mind here, N4, and 3 e so here we have N4, N3, and, uh, and the node N3 and the node E are each other's siblings. Now that seems a little counterintuitive at first, but you have to remember, okay, this is basically just a node, except a node without any children. And in terms of the number of nodes that separate them from the root, they are each other's siblings. This, this branch looks longer, but they are at the same number of internodes from the root, aren't they? So here we cross, we walk across the tree in a different order. We still can do the uh, pre-ordering uh, where we visit uh, parents before their children and the post-order where we visit children before their parents. So with this implementation, you can also um, do, for example, that post-order traversal for the pruning algorithm. And I think this is actually how it is implemented in Filip originally. So, okay, that's all very neat, uh, but this uh, presupposes that nodes are objects that have certain uh, things attached to them as attributes. So they might have a sibling or a first child or a name. But now let's move on to relational databases. Here we have the same tree again, and now the trick is, well, can we perhaps describe that tree shape as a table? Well, actually, uh, we can. So now here we have a table that looks a bit like a, a spreadsheet three columns. Uh, so there is the column ID, which is a unique identifier for every node in the tree. Uh, in context of relational databases, that is sometimes called a primary key, but in this case, it's just ID, unique ID. For each of those nodes, it, there is a name. So for example, here, uh, uh, node a, which is a terminal node, has uh, the name A, doesn't it? Then the column parent is a reference to an ID of another row in the table. So here the uh, parent of node A has ID 5, which is here a uh, node N1, right, you see? And a node one, N1 has a parent with ID 7, 
and that's note N3. And uh, N3 has a uh, parent with ID 9, and that's the root. And then uh, the root has no parent, obviously. So that's why this field here is empty. Now then, uh, let's have a look now at how this is done in our relational database. I have now opened the uh, trivial.db file in a uh, SQLite browser and we are now looking at the table node. Now this is a, a trivial database in the sense that there's uh, very little data in it and also it's a very simple database design because there's only a single table. Uh, now that might not necessarily be the case under different circumstances. So for example, tree base, that uh, database that is kind of like the gen bank for phylogenetic trees, it has, uh, if you were to load that in, in here, then it has over a hundred different tables that all have to do with different things, taxon identifiers, study publications, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Here we just have a single uh, table. And in this table, we have the uh, columns that we just looked at, the identifier, the name, the parent. We also have the branch length. Uh, so these are some values, uh, uh, 0, 1, 2, or 3. And we also have a uh, height. So the height is how far above the root we are. Now here there's also uh, these indices that should remind you of the uh, paraphyly and polyphyly operation where we had an index that is uh, treated in pre-order traversal which you might put on the left side of that uh, statement between curly braces and the post-order traversal after having visited everything else this is the second number for that same node within curly braces so these are the different columns in our little table now let's go and play with it a little bit okay let's see what happens the following so for example Let's figure out for a node that has the name N3, well, what is the name of the parent? So let's copy this. I'll uh, paste this statement in here. So what is happening here? we uh, are going to do a select statement. You don't have to remember the syntax. I'll just walk you through it to demonstrate what's go going on here. So select in uh, SQL says, well, I'm going to make a sub-selection basically from my total data set. Data set. And it says, well, what we're going to have is um, select it. We're going to select the name of P. Okay, what's P? Well, we're then going to say, well, we're going to query no the table called node, which is the only table that we have, and we're going to create two aliases. So we're going to create query from node, the node table, which we give the alias, the shortcut N for node, and again, uh, another alias where we call that table P for parent. And then we say, well, uh, then we restrict the query to say we only going to look at records where the name of n is n3 so that's just one row in our table 
And for N3, then if once we've matched that, we don't want to look up what the parent ID is of N, and then our result for P must match that. So the parent ID, that number must be the same as the field parent for the focal node. And we run that, and then we get as a result node N5. So now, does that make sense? We have node N3. Uh, so here we have node N3, okay, and for that node we look uh, what is its parent. Well, the parent is has the ID 2 in this column, so that must correspond to uh, some value in the ID column, and obviously that's then this one, and for that we want to have the name. So the name of the parent of N3 is N3. Five. Neato. Similarly, we can also select the children in the tree. So now we move across the tree not from tips to root, or from child to parent, but in the opposite direction. Let's do that. So here we are going to select the name of something called C and then again we make two aliases. So we look in the node table, we we're going to call that table N and we're going to call that table C and then we say well for N if it's called N3 we now want to see which of the records in node in table C have the ID of N3 as their parent. Right, so going in the opposite direction. So then we had uh, two results, uh, N2 and uh, D. So does that make sense? We have our node N3 and it has as its ID 3. Uh, so now we want two other nodes that have in this column three as their parent, so that's N2 and D. All right, so we can go in multiple directions across our tree shape. How about, for example, we want to know what the siblings are of node N3. Uh, so again, we uh, have uh, two versions of our table, we, so we call node as N and node as S, and from S for sibling we want to have its name, so we're going to select just the name, and then we say, well, if N is called N3, and N has a parent ID, then S needs to have that same parent ID, and S must not have the name N3, so I want the sibling and not also myself, not get myself back. Okay, run that, and that's N4. So basically it just says, well, they need to have the same parent ID. So N3 has a parent, 2. Does anyone else have a parent, 2? Yes, here. So N4 and N3 are each other siblings. Okay, so that is something that we can do, but uh, as uh, we're setting up here now, uh, this quickly becomes a little cumbersome. For example, if we want to have the grandparent of a node, so then we need to do this and then do another subclause where once we figured out what N4 is, then for N4 we want to have its parent. And okay, then you could actually express that in one single statement, but that gets unwieldy. Uh, here now come uh, the uh, uh, trick with the indices. So here SQL queries quickly become cumbersome, for example, when attempting to formulate recursive traversals. So here we have that concept recursion again. But there are some shortcuts to implement common queries. So for example, 
what if we want to have all of the descendants of the focal node so the focal node is the node that we're currently looking at like in this particular case that was node n3 now let's say for n3 we want to have all of the descendants so including the tips or we want to have for example all of the ancestors so the path from n3 all the way to the root or let's say we want to do something else such as get the most recent common ancestor for two nodes so for example for a node a and node d that would be n3 such queries can be implemented using additional pre-computed columns here come our indices here left is an integer that was incremented and assigned to the focal node in pre or order during a depth first traversal we just saw what that is kind of and right was incremented and assigned post order so incremented just means it's a counter that every step adds one so one two three four five that's an incrementing counter and here these indices have been assigned so here's our table now let's select the descendants of n3 so who is all a child of n3 So how does this work? Well, again, we have two aliases. So here we say, well, we have node n, which has the name n3. Uh, and then we have all its descendants. So those are records that are all going to be called d. And then from those, we want the name. Okay, and then we say, well, all these descendants must have a left index that is going to be larger than the left index of our focal node N3, and they have a right index that has to be smaller than the focal node. So that selects the clade A, B, C, D, uh, and also their respective parents N1 and N2. Or how about if we want to select the ancestors or ancestor of N3? Again, we have uh, two uh, aliases. Uh, A is for ancestor, N is our node N3. And now we just use these uh, indices in the opposite direction. So now the ancestors must have a left index that is uh, smaller than the, that of our focal node. So they are visited earlier in the pre-order traversal. And they must have a right index that is larger than our focal node. So that is in the post-order traversal. And uh, we execute that. Turns out there's only one node to which that applies, node N5. Now, finally, can we actually figure out in a single SQL query the most recent common ancestor of two nodes? So here we have, for example, the two tips A and C. And we are now going to do this whole query. So what is happening here? Um, this is still basically a single line, except I uh, indented it. You can see that it's a single line because only at the end there's the semicolon, which is the magic character for end of line. Now, what's happening here? Um, well, there is uh, now three aliases. We have uh, that we use the table node three times. One where we look for uh, the node called A, one for the node called C, 
and we're going to look for the most recent common ancestor. And then we say, well, give me the node that is called A. So here, this must match. The name is A. And for the other one, the name is C. Okay, so what's the most recent common ancestor? Well, it is somewhere along the ancestors for both. So the... Um, Oh, I think there's a typo here. Uh -huh. The uh, left index must be smaller, the right index must be larger, and that's going to actually give us all of the shared ancestors of both of these nodes. And then we finally say, well, then limit that to the first hit of the bunch. So the most recent common ancestor of A and C then is node N2. In other words, in a single query, we can uh, get the most recent common ancestor. Now, in this case, on this little tree, okay, well, we could just see that. When we look at the tree shape, uh, it should be obvious. But now imagine if you have a super duper large tree and then it's not so obvious. So that is then the exercise that we're going to do, which uh, leads us to the uh, third part of this demo. We have a whole bunch of species that we are presenting in our respective papers. Uh, some of these are plants. Uh, uh, some of these are other things. Uh, now let's say we are only just going to focus on the plants. So we have our crop species. Now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go break out into groups and then in each group we're going to take a uh, very large tree that has otherwise exactly the same structure. So Phytophilo is a uh, published uh, tree one of the phylogenetic megatrees, which we will uh, visit in a coming lecture. And uh, that tree uh, is encoded in a database just like this trivial example. So you can run a query just like this on it, except then you look for uh, crop species one, crop species two, and then you can figure out what the most recent common ancestor is. Now then, given that there's the uh, height, the uh, distance from the root, uh, it should be possible for any pair of crop species to figure out what the evolutionary distance is between them. I hope that makes sense. You can figure out, okay, how far from the root is one of them? How far from the root is the other? How far from the root is their most recent common ancestor? Uh, now you add up uh, the heights for the two crops and then from that you subtract the height for the most recent common ancestor and then you know the evolutionary distance between them. And uh, as we do this in breakout groups, we're going to figure out for each uh, breakout group what the greatest distance is among your set of crops and then as we return we're going to figure out what the greatest of those distances is, and then we're going to figure out if that's the greatest distance across the entire set. It might be, it might not be. So let's give that a try. <laughs> 